good morning, and um, we're just so, um, I'm so thrilled for another opportunity to come together and seek the Lord's face, to worship him, to thank him, and um, hear from him, because I will tell you with a total confidence that apart from him, I have nothing to say. But his word is so rich. And I, I want to mention just briefly before I pray this morning, um, you know, everybody's process is different when they are hearing from the Lord, especially if you're a teacher, preacher, or, or speaker. And um, it's funny, the Lord, I, I smile at how he deals with me sometimes because he'll give me a thought and give me a, a message title. He does it through titles. It's interesting. He'll just land something significant on me. But but then, as I get to thinking about it, um, and sometimes I'm on my audio Bible, and um, sometimes he'll say, stop everything and sit down and focus for a minute, totally on me. And other times, he'll just begin to download as I'm moving about, usually in the kitchen and cleaning up and stuff like that, as I'm just worshiping and listening to the word. But then when he, he begins to download, he'll give me scripture, and, and then it'll be like, oh, that's a good one. And, and then he'll give me another one, and I'll, I'll, that one will cross-reference to another one, and I'll be like, oh, this is so good. And, and I get so excited, and then all of a sudden, I get so many that he's like, okay, I, I'm gonna give you so, I can give you so many that will you start striving, and you're going to start writing down everything, and, and now you'll be in this place of, of an outline that's way too long to even deliver in the short time you have. Or you can just stop and just hear me in the moment, and I'll show you everything. And he's been teaching me that some of these downloads are just for me to just soak in, to be amazed at in his word. But what is to come out in the morning, he will give me as he decides and leads. So he did give me a couple of notes <clears throat> in his mercy and grace. He'll sometimes give me a couple of notes. But, um, but it's just really unpacking this, um, this concept that is very fundamental. Maybe you could use the word elementary because it is something we probably have read numerous times in Scripture that Jesus said. Um, but I want to just pray and just, um, again, just invite the Holy Spirit to take over. Father God, we just praise you. Thank you for the worship time. God, I just love, I just really love you, God, what we just sang. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross, for your sacrifice, for your love. Thank you for laying out in your word. And, and as I think so specifically of Ephesians, just unpacking who we are in Christ Jesus and your plan for your bride. Oh, it is glorious, and I just thank you for it. I just praise you, and I, I, I pray, God, for, for Greg and Wendy and Bryn, um, God, in their assignment this weekend away from us right now, God, just continue to move and uh, flow through them to complete your will for this weekend in the name of Jesus. And God, we just, uh, we just desire to hear from you and to be challenged, but also encouraged and, and um, invigorated, God, because in your presence is only just, just passion and, and just a wonder, God. It, it is such a place of fueling ourselves for readiness. So, God, we, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you just saturate us with your wisdom, with your revelation, I pray, God, that everyone's heart, including my own, is just, um, just ready and cultivated with my yes and surrender to allow the seeds of your word to go deep, deep down into the soil of my heart, God, that, that it would produce a great harvest according to your will. So, God, just, uh, just take over my mouth, Father, and um, I just love you, Lord. Thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, I ask all this. Amen. I have been in a place where it, it just never ceases to amaze me, um, the words of Jesus. When I look at, if you guys have red letter edition, and it's on the phones as well when, you, when you're on um, you know, audio Bible or you just use your phone to read. Um, I, I'm so struck by Jesus' ministry, what he shared, what he taught, and um, one of the th places that I wanted to go to as kind of our key is Matthew 7. So if you would just turn with me. For the most part this morning, I'll be in um, the ESV version, but um, I really love other translations. 
and these dual um, translation Bibles. I haven't in a while used my four translation Bible. That one is just so thick because it's like you're looking at four translations at once. But I've kind of fallen in love with my, my paper ESV Bible, which I love. But Matthew 7 is where we want to start this morning. And this is, um, these are the words of Jesus uh, speaking here. And he, is, he was teaching the people who were, who were following him, air quotes there, following him. They were really just, there was a curiosity to find out who this person was. They were amazed at the authority with which he spoke. And it was because when Jesus came on the scene, he came to introduce a kingdom introduction of thinking that, that was a breakthrough in what they had been taught really focused mainly on the law. He, he wanted to bring the kingdom reality. And of course, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. And I think that was, and even in this, this passage, you know, the people were so amazed at the authority with which he spoke because they couldn't, they couldn't quite discern what, this is different. Like something's, di- something's going on here. You know, when you, when you know the weightiness of words of, of a person, I, there, is, uh, there is somebody, I won't name them, but I will tell you, every time they speak, there is something of a weight in the spirit that is carried from the words that they speak, even in personal testimony, in just insight, in, in sharing a revelation they got that is such a reflection of where they are in their secret place time with the Lord. It's like they're, they're, they're so filled up in their deep, deep place of, um, of communing with the Lord that, that it's, it's like the song says, you know, fill my cup to overflow, that when they speak, it is the outflow of the Spirit just overflowing, just bubbling over because of, of they're just saturated with being with the Lord. And so whatever is squeezed or requested of them, it's just out comes the Lord. Isn't that the way, way you want to be? Like, don't, don't you want to have it? And it, it's a real place of surrender, isn't it? Because it's like, I so want to crucify my flesh and die daily so that, that every bit of room is made available for the Lord to just flow through me. Oh, I desire that. Don't you just desire that? Uh, the Lord's been working with me on my words even in, in, my, in my own tent, the privacy of our tents, because what happened with the children of Israel? You know, they murmured in their tents, and the Lord heard it. They might have been able to hide it from their peeps, from their church people, from their other you know, tent dwellers during this time of, you know, and, and feeling like, well, hey, man, we're on a faith walk. I mean, we left Egypt. You know, we believe, and we, we know that's God in the sky and the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. You know, we're, we're good. And then they go in their tents, and they murmur. You know, I just don't know. This is not what it's cracked up to be. Well, I don't know. I mean, does God do this? Like, does that really what he, I mean, I don't know. Murmuring. And it hindered their literal arrival to their destiny, that first generation. So sad. Man, I, the Lord's been dealing with me on my very words and, and my reactions and my responses. And, and then, then he took it to the next level. And now he is literally working on me on my very thoughts toward a situation. It's like if you, if you get to the place where you, you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can zip your lip and not speak, he's going to go to the next level. And he's going to change your very thoughts toward a situation. When your thought goes to criticism, when your thought goes to, well, pff, okay, well, you know, I don't, this kind of an attitude in the Spirit, it has weight and it hinders the weight of the Holy Spirit flowing through you. And so we're constantly in that refining process. Jesus had this kind of weight in the words that he spoke. And it wasn't discernible and understood fully, but the people knew something was different, something was special. So in Matthew 7, and we're going to start in verse 24, um, Jesus, this, this whole passage, man, from even back to chapter 5 through this point, he's, he's just putting out these, these concepts that on the surface, maybe humanly speaking, would just seem like, okay, that's just an interesting little like story. But it, it just had a depth that caused people's mouth to drop open, like, wow. So in verse 24 in the ESV, it says, everyone then who hears these words of mine, because he had been speaking, and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell. And great, great was the fall of it. Whew, heavy, heavy. So Derek and Jules, what I'm going to have you guys do is, in the assignment that I gave you earlier, you are going to build what a house would look like founded on the rock and what a house would look like founded on sand. And so as you hear the message this morning, I want that to be interpreted in your project. And you know me, there will be a prize. So that's not your motivation of your heart. That's just my love to give gifts. I need that. So <laughs> I know, I thought everybody's going to be jealous. Can we just go back there and join them? It's just so fun. Um, the title the Lord gave me this morning for my message, which you can put up there, is Rock or Sand. It's just as simple as that. Rock or Sand. And when he first said that to me, I just said, oh, okay. I think I threw the dish towel over my shoulder, and I was like, okay, give me a second. Press pause on my audio Bible. Rock or sand? I cannot speak like Greg could to the, the parallel in the human realm of building because he was an actual builder. Like he can speak to, he has the language to describe you know, all the different aspects of how you build a house well, right, with uh, the right kind of structure and strength. But I do know that a faulty, weak, or shoddy foundation is um, going to eventually reveal itself in a home at, if it is if it is there. And it's interesting that I have seen, there was actually a house for a time on our block that for many, many years, beautiful house. I mean, it was like, what's, what's the deal? This was so great and nobody bought it. Well, then I looked into it and I found out it was because there was a, found, a faulty foundation issue where it had a major crack and that, you know, there was nobody advising anybody to buy it because it's like, you know, whatever, whatever the cosmetic look that it has above ground, you don't want to mess with this until that foundation is fixed, right? So I do know that, that when you are building something, it must be built on something solid. You know, there's a lot in Scripture that, that is this, um, this metaphor, this symbolism of rock. And first I want to just take you to a couple of scriptures that talk about it, and that is um, Psalm 71, verse 3. And um, there's a couple of places, actually. Let's, um, let's do, actually, sorry, let's do 31 first, and then we'll go to 71. 31, Psalm 31, verses 3 and 4, uh, actually 2 and 3. Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily, be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress. You hear a lot about strong fortress all throughout the Psalms. For you, verse 3, are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. Um, there are so many great, great um, Psalms about that. Let's look then over at 71 and... Um, I didn't save all of my places here, although you can pull that up. Yeah, 71 verse 3. And that one says, Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. God is such a rock. Um, there is an absolutely beautiful psalm that um, I want to read almost in its entirety, and I really want you to just think about these words. Man, if this does not, this is just so about today. It's Psalm 18, but before we go there, I want to look at uh, Isaiah. So Psalm 18 is, is going to be a heavy one, and that's where the Bible verse comes from uh, for the kids today in verse 2a. But I want to go to Isaiah first because it's kind of like a warning. Isaiah um, 
8 is an interesting passage. And it says in verse, starting in verse 11, this is a a charge that Isaiah is making to fear God and, and to wait for the Lord. And it says in verse 11, For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me. He warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. Listen to this through the lens of today. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Why in the world, let me grab this over here, this tissue. Why in the world would they be snared and taken? The rock of the Lord Jesus can be a firm foundation or the biggest thing you can trip and stumble over because of your unwillingness to be on it to see it first and then stand upon it. If you don't want to be part of the rock that is available for you, it will be a boulder that will harm you trying to get past it. It's an interesting thing. Jesus represents, of course, the, the chief cornerstone, right? He is the cornerstone. And, and I, I want to bring you to a couple of scriptures because that actual passage in Matthew 7 is Jesus speaking from Psalm 118, 22 and 23, about being the stone that the builders rejected, okay? Um, he will, and people will fall on it and be broken to pieces. It's, it's like what we're hearing with, we know the Spirit is going to be poured out, right? And it will either be just his glory will, will, the weight of his glory will just completely consume and rejuvenate us, or it will absolutely crush us because we were unwilling to, to receive it. We were not on that foundation. I was thinking a little bit, even before we go to the next scripture, um, years ago, and you might remember the year, I'm not sure, but years ago we went on Greg's side of the family to Orcas Island um, to do a, like a little family reunion, and it was, it was interesting. In, in Washington State, we... Um, we visited um, Colin's sister and some additional family on, on that side. And Brooke was young, I don't know, maybe eight or nine, I don't remember. And I remember that there on one of the, um, the shores, there were these enormous rock configurations that were on the, the shore area of that, if you've ever been there. And um, I was really struck by, I wasn't, I'm not, I've never really been an outdoor girl kind of person. <laughs> not that you couldn't figure that one. But, but I went there with Greg, and we were with uh, his sister, Shepherd at the time, because they brought their dog. And, and so we, we took the dog out for a walk, and we were standing on these huge rocks, these, these boulders that were in the, in the sand. And it got pretty, I mean, the waves coming in were, I just, I, I was so struck by noticing how much they were just crashing against the rock, and then pulled back, and then it was crashing against the rock, and then pushing back. And, and it was just so interesting to see, especially when you walked out further into the water on the top of the boulder, just this, this feeling of you're just solid. I mean, like the waves and the wind and the, even the, the smaller rocks that were driven by the waters rushing it up was just not moving this thing. It was just huge. It was absolutely impenetrable and unshakable. And when you think about um, being on an actual beach and building a sandcastle, if anybody's ever done that in their childhood or maybe with their children, you know, even in recent years, you can build a pretty significant, and I've seen some that are like Guinness Book of World Records, awesome, you know, how they make these structures in the sand, these sandcastles, and they can be pretty amazing. When a structure is just built of these little particles kind of held together by a slight bit of moisture, it really takes nothing 
when the waves hit or even wind hits it for it to completely dissolve. And I've obviously seen cases where somebody got a really nice looking sandcastle either halfway or three-fourths of the way built and then some jerk comes through, you know, either with a bucket of water or just with the, you know, the water from their towel or something and it hits their sandcastle and then everybody's fighting <laughs> because they messed it up. But how easily it is dissolved with the slightest bit of interference with those substances, whether it be the water or, or something hitting it. And what a difference. You know, Jesus was talking about a person who builds their life on the rock versus builds their life. It's not just what you're standing on in the moment. That's part of it. But he said though, the person who builds, meaning the process with which you are living your life. It, it, is, the, it is building something that has a, a solid foundation so that when you begin to see life storms hit, it doesn't move. And as a child, I remember... Um, singing the song, maybe some of you know that the wise man built his house upon the rock, wise man built his house upon the rock, wise man built his house upon the rock, and um, what, what's the next line? Does anybody know it? And the rains came tumbling down, yeah, the rains came down and the floods came up, the rains came down and the floods came up, the rains came down and the floods came up, and the house on the rock stood firm, you know, and then you go through the whole song with the sand, and instead of the firm, it's, and the house on the sand went splat, and all the kids yell. And I remember thinking, you know, that, that was a kid's song, I never forgot that. I, I just thought, yeah, that's what happens when you're actually building a house on sand, you know, there, there's not much that will shake it. I am seeing, we are in the day, the winds are blowing, the waters are raging, and I'm beginning to see the rock, and I'm beginning to see the sand, and they're not in the same place. There are rocks that are standing firm and almost seem to be, coming, to be becoming more strengthened with the pressures and the things hitting it. It's, it's, and I remember back at Orca, Orca's Island thinking, man, I wonder if, if what caused these boulders to just be so ruggedly unmovable is that they've just weathered so many different atmospheric issues and pressures. It's like it just formed something even more solid. And I'm seeing that in believers who are rising up and becoming just more solid, like, like they're, they're just, it's digging in with more of a hardened place of faith um, and then those on sand are just, little by little, just on sand are just dissolving. It's like the formation of, of the, the castle that was built, uh, not so at the top anymore. And okay, now, oop, that wall came down. And well, oh, that, boy, that backside that seemed like it was really firm, that's starting to kind of cave. And you're, you're like, well, Lord, what is going on? You know what? It, it really is a building of faith or flesh. It's really what it boils down to. There's an interesting verse in Romans 1. I think it's in Romans 1.17. So before we go to Psalm 18, let's go to Romans. Um, I, I just, it was something that I thought I would take you to. It's, it's really about um, uh, faith to faith is the, is the ver words that I wanted to bring you, but it's, it's so good. And I, I brought this out to the ladies' class a few weeks ago. Um, but Romans chapter 1, and it is... Is it one? Is it one seventeen? Mm -mm, that's not it. Somebody has to Google that. Bible verse, faith to faith. You'll come up with it just like that. Tell me what the reference is. Uh, yes, it is one seventeen. Okay, so sorry. Thank you. I was looking at the wrong chapter. For in the righteousness, yes. For I am not ashamed. Verse sixteen is the build up to it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. When we start our walk by faith, because that's the only way, it is by faith we are saved. 
okay? Not by works of righteousness, lest anyone, um, that, that anyone is done, um, lest we would be boasting in it, right? So from that faith, we then move to the next faith. There is a process of building. When Jesus is the faith chief cornerstone upon which our salvation is built, and it is, we then, starting there, build the next layer of our faith to the next layer of faith. There are people starting as believers on the capstone, on the, the rock, who from there on have built it on flesh. And so even though they are justified and have received Jesus as their Savior in the sanctification, they have built a faulty house that is very, very susceptible to being completely dissolved. And it's, it's a sand house. Now, it's a complete sand all the way through the floor if they've not accepted Jesus. But you can, you can start with that base stone, but then not build a solid foundation upon which you stand that's fortified, and it's the good strongholds. It's not the demonic strongholds, but you can actually build like a beachhead, a stronghold of the Lord Jesus in your life with that shield of faith that is able to extinguish all the fiery darts. That faith process of building your life, your house, will make you unshakable. That is what God desires. And what's awesome is it's not something we are building in our own with our own hands. It is built literally with that relationship. Greg and I, I didn't take courses to build a solid marriage. Now, some people do. They take all kinds of classes and they read all kinds of marriage books. I really have never seen that actually become what builds a strong marriage. You know what builds a strong marriage? Relationship with your spouse. Surrender, commitment, love, just a, a complete 100% given on both parties to each other, that oneness, that, that communication. You know, that's a picture of Jesus and the bride, right? That Jesus and the, the church is, is a picture of marriage. And it's, it's like the solid foundation of Jesus building on that in my relationship is what builds the strength of my house, just like from the I do Okay, that doesn't, the second Greg and I had, had our wedding and we said, I do, we did not immediately have a strong marriage. We had a foundation of a covenant that was made in the name of Jesus by getting married, but then began the process of building that relationship. And the strength of that grew in our willingness to communicate, to love one another, the sacrifice, the commitment, the selflessness selfishness is a great way to destroy a relationship in a marriage. That's why one of the number one reasons that are listed on divorce papers is irreconcilable differences. Of course it's irreconcilable. It's because you didn't do everything I wanted. You differed with me, and I'm not willing to reconcile. So sign the papers. We're done. It's so sad. And with Jesus, it's not a, he's not a substitute for Santa, and you didn't give me what I wanted, and it's not what I thought it would be, and this is just too hard, and I know, I know, I think I saw somewhere in this, you know, in, the, in this book that in this world you'll have tribulation, you know, but I'm not of good cheer because <laughs> I'm not overcoming the world. You know, it's like we see these verses and we don't apply them to real life. Paul was told at the beginning of his, his um, ministry of training before his public ministry, after his conversion in in the, the road to Damascus experience, the Lord said, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my sake. See, those are the hard things. And I actually thought the message title today was going to be the hard things, but the Lord's going to have me unpack that another time. But there are hard things that just boil down to absolute faith. Sand is leaning on your own understanding. Sand is, well, A plus B doesn't equal C in, in my intellect, so therefore it must not be the case. That's sand. Um, when you are um, 
in Ephesians 4, it talks about the, the futility of our minds. You know, you, you're actually, and, and Shannon brought this out this morning in the, for the ladies, which is such a great lesson, and it's posted on the thing so you can listen to it, girls, if you weren't there. Um, the futility of your mind that Paul was charging the, the church, the Ephesus church, to not walk after like the Gentiles was because if you have a hardness of your heart and, and an unwillingness to believe for what you don't understand, it literally will hinder you from having greater understanding. So it's like one of these places you get to where you think, okay, I need to do this and do this and, and you know, uh, I need to strive and structure and create this, this bubble of protection for myself to be protected from deception. And the Lord is like, that's not how you get protected from deception. You, you literally move from faith to faith, to more faith. The, the willingness to believe, not the willingness to believe in anything, but the willingness to believe him. Our faith is founded in him. There are people that talk about faith in an empty blanket way that is a twisted version of the biblical faith. I'm talking about faith in our author and finisher, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord, the God of the Bible, Jesus that is God, the God of the Bible, the only God. Faith in faith is a whole lot of nonsense, and that's going to take you into crazy town. And, and it really does um, show up in the fruit uh, of a person's life. But this place of being willing to believe will literally be the, the protection that you need from deception because more wisdom and revelation can be trusted by the person who trusts first. Submit yourself, James says, therefore to God. Resist the devil, okay? Resist meaning I want nothing of him. I'm going to totally, totally surrender. Submit myself to God. Resist the devil, the two pieces of my, my will. And then he will flee. There, there is a deception that God will break off when I first surrender and then resist. God will do it. And this supernatural veil of, of um, really an inability to, to see what's actually going on today and, and to discern what's happening is there due to somewhere along the line in the process of the building of their house where there was a decision made, an opportunity to make a decision that was 1,000% God, and there was a little bit pulling back. Now, I want you to go back to the analogy of this building of this house or house on sand. You know, when you're building a house, and, and I, I, we've heard stories, and they've even done some TV shows um, in the, in the fixer-upper type shows where they, they show this house that's really a mess and they call in the people to help us fix it. And you begin to kind of hear the testimony and the story of how did it get to be like this? How did this, how in the world did this collapse or how did this end up leaking? And when you go back, sometimes the, the homeowners, especially if they were the, you know, closer to the original ones, you begin to see that yes, when we got to this point in the process of building, we listened to somebody who had this advice, somebody who maybe shortcutted this, and we said, okay, well, yeah, let, let's just do it. You know, I don't have the money, or, well, it'll be faster, and, well, or they just, it was just ignorance, and they weren't willing to do their due diligence to find out if the advice they were getting is right. So, so they make this decision not based on wisdom, and, and it seems fine for a while. It's a good patchwork. I mean, you could patch a whole lot of things. I have, I have done some patchwork nobody would want to know about in terms of a shortcut <laughs> version of how can this be fixed when we're waiting on it, you know, and Greg, Greg and I, that's one of the things that's kind of been laughably an argument through the years where I'm just like, oh, just throw it up, just do this. And the builder in him's like, that is not the way it's done, you know, you just can't do it like that. I'm like, no, I'm telling you, if you put enough paper clips together with a bobby pin, you can hang this picture. And he's like, listen, I know the weight of this picture, and it will hang for about a week, and then it will come crash into the floor. And then I go, no, it won't. And then he goes, yes, it will. He's right. I will give him that. Greg, you are right. Things have come crashing to the floor because it's not good to do bobby pins and safety pins and paper clips when you're hanging stuff. Use the right materials. So that metaphor is true with building. And how often when we look back and we say, okay, 
how did I get here? Have you ever, have you ever done that? Um, and and it's, not, it's not really wise to do a self-evaluation except self in the sense of I'm willing to look at myself by my choice, but God, show me. It's, the, it's the, really the words of David, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, see if there's any wicked way in me. If you see yourself through your human lens, you will be like the person that looks in the mirror and sees a mess and then walks away as if they saw nothing. Because so, there, there are many reasons. We just either don't see it or we have no capacity to do anything about it with what we're seeing. If you ever just, if you ever just looked at, I mean, I know in the house analogy, if you, I, I've, at times I've opened the closet and gone, yeah, this is bad. I just shut the door. <laughs> I'm going. I was like, I don't know where to begin. I don't know how. I don't know. I can't. I'm in denial that it is even in that condition. So I'm walking away. And, you know, and, and we laugh about that, but we can't do that with our lives. Now, in our flesh, we would have to. There is no other way. But God is like, man, let me Jesus is the one that tears down the strongholds. He is mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. And that, and we start with the surrendered willingness of verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 10, which is what I'm referring to, that we are the ones that by our choice and our yes to submit and resist, we cast down imaginations, suggestions, proud arguments. We have that moment. See, in that moment of building our house, if we don't cast down that imagination, that, that proud argument, it's something that comes to you. There is intense psychological warfare hitting us. And, and this, this generation is, is, we were talking about that yesterday at the gifts meeting. There is an onslaught that is all out for the minds of our young people today. Like we have never seen, never seen. Most of the time it is because there is this little piece of technology in a phone or an iPad that is so attached to our brains, it may as well be a chip that's inserted. I mean, how many of us, you know, even old school people, there is, is a new normal that if you don't have your phone, you kind of kind of feel like there's a part of you that's, that's missing. It's like, am I dressed? You know, I don't have my phone. <laughs> I feel like I'm naked. I don't know. It's not as bad for older people because we know what it was like pre-cell phone. I mean, Greg's giant phone that looked like some CB radio kind of thing was the first phone in the 80s that he had in his little, whatever it was, a Pinto car. I don't know, it was, whatever was happening. I look back and it's dorky, but man, at the time, it was so cool. All the kids at church, they just came and they were like, well, that guy's got a cell phone. And he picks it up and it's huge. It's like some dinosaur, you know, like some shoe, you know, you're putting to your ear, but it was cool. It was very cool. We know what it was like to, um, I've weathered Minnesota winters with no cell phone. I mean, how do, how do you do that now? You feel like if you go across the street to Wawa and you don't have your phone, you know, all these scenarios of what could happen to you, and it's just crazy. But there is a downside to that that is very serious. Technology it has, is a beautiful thing allowed by God, but technology without God-centered boundaries are what's dangerous. See, the tech companies and the inventors and the makers of these that have brilliant minds, what they lack is an understanding of the doctrine of demonology that is a huge factor in how technology is used. And this is why we're seeing all kinds of crazy. We're seeing essentially what amounts to transhumanism, all kinds of of uh, God-like steps being taken through, through technology that are absolutely man's pursuit to be God and his own God. And as you know, we, we fought against that kind of a, a declaration with the, the issue with this satanic conference going on in, in Arizona. This pursuit of, and that is the promise of the enemy. He wants, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. He wants to pursue young minds to be completely autonomous of any kind of responsibility or another person. And so, so this strategy through COVID and all that's happened is like, let's isolate and saturate their minds and inundate and um, completely indoctrinate and let it be the message that, that I'm saying. He comes against their identity and then the oppressive spirit and the inability to cast these things down builds a house that is so fragile and on sand, and then you have this rise of wokeness that now causes any breeze to send you into a safe space. Well, what's happening here? 
You know, it's like there was just a breeze. Oh, I got to go get somebody. Tell me I'm fine. Tell me I'm fine. You know, it's so sad. It's so sad. It's laughable, but so sad. And Jesus is like, the foolish man builds his house on the sand, but the wise man builds his house on a rock. So discern today, rock or sand. See, the building process isn't just whammo one decision, there's my house. You guys know that. Have you ever had a house built? It takes months, many, many months, sometimes more than we want to have months taken. And each step is critical for the next step. If you don't have a good base, even in a window structure, and then you go and you just slap curtains on it, you can't, you can't skip the, the steps that it takes to make a strong window for when that storm comes. And if you've ever seen steps being missed, I mean, we're, there, was a, there was a whole lot. The house even that we moved into, it was interesting. It was built by some builders that halfway through the project went out of business. So a bank took it over. And they did some patchwork and sent in a couple of guys. And we got in. And I'm telling you, it was like, um, I really think, the electrical situation that was put in our house, I think it was by a whole bunch of a group of people all smoking some weed. <laughs> and they were just, let's see if we'll put that wire there. Maybe we'll put that wire here. And you know, maybe we'll put some under the floor. I mean, we had to learn the hard way for years that the way this thing was wired up. It was just... It was just laughable, and, and it, we had to learn it in embarrassing ways. We have a huge gathering at our house, and we go to make the next pot of coffee, and every light goes out. It takes us <laughs> 45 minutes. Everybody's in the dark. And um, anyway, stories, good times, right? But the Lord wants our process to be every step built on him. Don't take a shortcut. It's not worth it. The winds are blowing now. The storm is here. So shortcuts that were taken, we are going back. God's saying, go back and deal with it. Agree with your adversary quickly. Go to the courts for the freedom that Jesus, that I paid for, Jesus is saying, with my blood. And be free, okay? Be free in the truth of what the cross is all about. Because when the winds pick up, you will either be solidly on your rock and be able to, I mean, it's an amazing place to be able to be in a storm on a rock, immovable, and discern being able to be a help to those who are being tossed all around or being able to even accomplish God's will for you in those moments than when you are tossed to and fro because of faulty things that you decided to slap some pretty curtains over or hang up with bobby pins and paper clips and have no idea uh, what's about to happen. And the shaking has begun. See, shaking is not intimidating. You know, we don't, when you know you got a solidly built home, you just aren't, I mean, it's amazing. They, you know, they have houses now in these earthquake places, places where earthquakes are more prevalent, that, that are really amazing in their ability to go with the movements. They, they, it's like they've discovered, you know, these um, architects that have discovered what materials are needed to be able to weather these kinds of things. And that's what Jesus shows us. He, he wants to build us in a way to weather the shaking so that we are not phased. We know that we are in a place where we will make it through, and, and all of his promises will, will come through. So let's go to Psalm 18. This is just such a great psalm. And I just, um, here I thought it was going to be just a couple of verses, and I was just like, whoa, this whole chapter was just so amazing. <sighs> Verse 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Mm. That's just, it says it all. Man, wake up and say that verse. Psalm 18, 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. I love you, O Lord, my strength. First of all, it'll declare strength over you because you do have it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have that strength. So love him for it. It is the will of God that we be thankful. Thank him. He's your strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. Now, to the word refuge is the Bible verse for today. So, Brooke, you can help, help them write that down. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, 
my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. It would have been shorter for the younger ones, but they can do it. The rest of that verse, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Now, what's interesting is the rest of this. I'm going to read on a little bit further, and I'm telling you, this is what is happening and what is about to ramp up, and we know we've heard the prophets talk about an an event or an eruption or something that's coming in the coming days. Um, are you ready without an evil foreboding bracing yourself? See, the enemy would have us walking in a, you know, kind of a, a nervousness and a paranoia of what's coming. But the Lord wants to be like, I'm going to in my grace and mercy through my prophets, I'm going to just warn you of what's coming. And I just want you to just soak in me so that when the winds blow and the rains come, you will stand firm because you're not a foolish man who built their house. So it says, verse 3, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. For his temple, for, excuse me, from his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Praise God. Then the earth reeled and rocked, and if you don't think that's going to happen in the human realm, just wait. Okay, it is. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils, he sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me. For they were too mighty for me. They, they confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. This is where we're, we're going to be. The, the, the promise for the righteous, this is where we'll be in the midst of this shaking that is increasing and coming. He rescued me because I delighted in him. Or excuse me, he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. This is purity. This is purity, guys. According to the cleanliness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. So the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Oh, God, with the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. That's the turmoil, the turmoil that the ungodly are dealing with. This inner turmoil, no matter how they want to present themselves on Facebook or Instagram, the turmoil is real if they're rejecting God. For you save a humble people, verse 27, but the haughty eyes you bring down. For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. And by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me 
with strength and make my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war. That's what he's doing now, guys, so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand supported me, and your gentleness made me great. You have a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them. Okay, we are on the offensive now, right? We have the authority, and did not turn back until they were consumed. That's what we prayed about yesterday. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet, for you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me. And those who hated me, I destroyed. They cried for help, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. And they will, by the way. There will be people crying to the Lord who are not surrendering to the Lord. They're just desperate to finally have him come. It's weird. Do you know there are actually people that will cry out to the Lord who actually have no intent on serving them? We think sometimes some of these verses sound cold-hearted, but the Lord knows the hearts of the people. There's a whole lot of people that will cry out of their guilt and their pain, but not out of their surrender. I beat them, verse 42, as fine as dust before the wind. Remember, this is a battle in the spirit. I cast them out like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with the people. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. That is where the remnant is going. It is happening. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who delivered me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You rescued me from the man of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever, for those who believe. It's a long chapter, but it is worthy of declaring this morning. So, rock or sand? Father, we praise you. God, we love you. Oh, God, you are worthy. You are worthy of our every being surrendered to you. God, I pray this morning we may build our house upon the rock of you, Lord Jesus, the chief cornerstone, the capstone. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And so, Father, I want to declare the words of this old hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. The third verse in that, his oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, then is, then is all my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. In him my righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Father God, We just declare, and I declare it, and I know I'm in unity, God, with those whose hearts are seeking you this morning. There is 
no other ground that will not sink that is apart from you, God. You are our rock and our fortress and our stronghold. God, I pray that we would rest upon you and know that your love and the fellowship with you and the relationship that we build, which builds our house, this place of seeking you for every single step of the process, for not taking shortcuts, not leaning on our own understanding and the futility of our minds because of the hardness of our heart, because of the difficulties that we, we shrink back and are not willing to believe you for. God, all these things, sand, 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 and it will be rushed away when the flood of your Holy Spirit is poured out. God, you desire us to stand on the rock because the weight of your Holy Spirit falling will either establish us or it will crush us. So God, I pray that each one of us would just seek your face and oh, what the benefit is, is beyond what we can even imagine. I hath not seen or ear heard, neither hath it even entered into the heart of man, the things that you have prepared for those who love you. The things right now, the fellowship, the love, the communication, your presence, it's so sweet. So God, I just pray that we would be rock upon you, Jesus, who is our rock. In Jesus' name, amen.